Welcome, everyone. Uh, this will be this program. Whoops, there's the dean. Okay, I guess I should admit her. <laughs> <laughs> Probably good. Irina, I'll work on admitting people now while you introduce. Perfect. Thanks. All right, I'd like to welcome everyone to this special program by the uh, Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY. I'm Irina Choi Stern. I'm Director of Alumni Services. Um, this will be a very fast-paced program, 45 minutes from start to finish. It'll be about 20 to 25 minutes of a conversation. Um, and please post any questions in the chat room. The program will be recorded because there's been a lot of requests from people who cannot make this, um, cannot participate today, that they really want to see it, uh, including lots of faculty members. Um, please keep your mics muted. And with no further ado, I would like to welcome Samantha Stark, class of 2010, the director of Framing Britney Spears, and Melanie Ben Cosme, class of 14, the associate producer, and Marlo Stern, who will be in conversation with them. He's the senior entertainment editor at the Daily Beast, and also my son. So, um, Marlo, it's yours. Thanks. Uh, hey, hey, everybody. Um, and hey, Samantha and Melanie, thanks for participating. Um, so I, I guess, you know, just for starters, um, since this is a, a Newmark talk, I mean, could you kind of give us like a brief sort of overview of your journey from Newmark to directing this popular documentary? <laughs> Yes, first of all, I'm so excited to be here. I love the this school so much. Um, I often say that it changed the whole course of my life. I would never be doing this if I didn't go to CUNY and Newmark and I love you guys. And it's so nice to see my um, some of my teachers and classmates here. Um, and uh, yeah, so when I was in journalism school here um, over the summer I interned at WNYC the radio station and it was to be to try to launch a video on their radio platform so um, and then after that while I was in my last semester I interned at the New York Times with Jim Estrin at the Lens blog and there was a woman who was doing a project on LGBTQ youth there, Sarah Kramer, and Jim like knew I was interested in that and walked me over and got me to intern with her instead. Then the video department. Then I left and then they called me because they needed someone to fill in while someone was on maternity leave for six weeks. And then I never left. So um, that is the story. So I was in the video department for eight, uh, seven and a half years at that point. It's been almost nine now. And they, we launched this TV show, which is all I ever wanted to do, longer form stuff. And I decided so to apply for the job there. And it was like back and forth if I was gonna get it. And then I finally got it. Um, and now it's the second iteration where we're doing films. And this is actually the first feature length film we've made in the, the series called New York Times Presents. Um, okay, uh, on to me. I'll, um, so I graduated in 2014 um, and uh, out of grad school, I started working at NBC on their short docs unit. Um, I was there for about uh, five years and then I um, started freelancing. And so I've worked with a bunch of companies this year. And um, I actually received an email, and I'm not sure if it was from Irina or um, one of the amazing people at CUNY, um, that was just sort of like, hey, the New York Times Presents is looking for an AP. And I was like, I can do that. I can, um, I can make the switch, which was from, you know, short docs of what I've been doing to sort of more of this long form and, uh, you know, being able to work with the New York Times and uh, work on a project that's on Hulu and FX was really exciting to me. And um, so through that email, it just uh, sort of put me in touch with Sam and it was the magic of, uh, you know, the, the Newmark network and connections, uh, which is seemingly never ending. I was sort of doing the math yesterday and I was like, when did I graduate and how long has it been? Um, and it's been about like seven years. And I think that what's really special to me about the school is that 
there are just like a handful or more of professors that to this day I'll still email and, and talk about different work or um, talk about prospective jobs and things like that. And it's never a burden and it's always just sort of like, yes, I remember you, you're talented. I will recommend you. I will put my name out there for you. And um, anyway, that's and how then, I met Sam. Yes, and I interviewed, she, Mel was the last person I interviewed. I interviewed 20 people and she was definitely the most impressive. And it wasn't just from CUNY, but I felt like we, we um, really had the same sensibility. So I was so excited to work with her because I felt like she um, really was into this narrative storytelling, human perspective stuff. And, and we actually have only met once in real life, even though we've worked together for seven months or something every day. Yeah. Because um, of the pandemic. So it's July. Wow. Um, so yeah, I mean, as far as the Britney doc goes, when did you start working on the film and how did you sort of catch wind of this subject? How familiar were, were you with it too, entering into it? Um, so the New York Times presents works like very differently than an independent documentary where you'll, you'll have the idea and pitch it. Uh, we work as a huge team. So we, uh, Liz Day, who appears in the film, who's one of the um, senior editors there, she had been wanting to do this for years. And the way she pitched it was OJ Made in America, but for Britney Spears. So the original <laughs> concept was to, you know, confront ourselves with the media, the misogynistic and unfair media coverage of Britney Spears, um, you know, now through this lens of 2020 or 2021. Um, and while we were reporting, um, we started learning more and more about this conservatorship that a lot of people don't know Britney's in. And it had been really stagnant for like 12 years. And as we're filming, these court documents start dropping where that indicate that Britney wants something to change in her conservatorship, wants her dad out. And so um, I had been with the fans before and they had all been kind of running on this gut instinct, something's wrong. I know she doesn't like this, she doesn't want it, but they never knew. So a lot of people wrote them off as conspiracy theorists, but then, um, at, so we got to kind of like capture the transformation because once she started putting these court documents out, then they were vindicated all of a sudden and they were right. And so it felt like there was a natural little arc there also. So um, then our film kind of transformed and became longer because it was supposed to be like 40 minutes originally. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I, I sort of went into it thinking that it was going to be like a 30 minute film and then it just like sort of grew and grew. And when you have a rough cut that's like over two hours long, you're like, okay, I don't think that this is going to be a 30 minute piece anymore. <laughs> um, uh, but the, the sort of, I think that the pitch and sort of our treatment of it was sort of a rolling ball in that, you know, I think in the beginning we anticipated that it was going to be a piece that was going to be sort of reflective and looking back at, um, you know, how Britney was treated over the years and specifically media criticism and, and, and things like that throughout her life and through her rise. Um, but then as we were working on it, there were just so many new developments um, happening in the conservatorship that we ended up uh, sort of shifting a bit. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned OJ Made in America, and you know that is a sprawling eight-hour, you know, project. I mean, how how sort of difficult was it to work within the constraints that you had to? Because this is this is something that you know many have said may deserve like an eight-episode sort of docu series treatment. I mean, it's it's such a it's such a complicated story. Um, and so, what what challenges did that pose for you guys? It was. I mean, it it really could have been a, a whole series, and we we discussed this too we're just like we should just pitch this as a as a standalone series and we have enough content to be able to do that um i think that one of the parts of our documentary was to sort of help people understand what britney's situation was um and sort of lay down the groundwork for what the situation is what a conservatorship is and um sort of the also incorporating the media, the media criticism um, throughout her career um, and sort of turn a mirror, if that makes sense, or show, you know, show how we were culpable in, in some of her really tough times. Um, but yeah, Sam. 
Yeah, I mean, we had to pick and choose what to include because there was just so much. Yeah. We watched like 10, you know, our, one weekend, Liz, Mel, and I watched like hours and hours, 10 hours of uh, Britney media coverage. And it was so horrifying that we had to, you know, you could just listen to people make fun of Britney over and over all day. And uh, you could listen to people try to make Britney cry over and over all day. But we wanted, we didn't want to, we wanted to confront our audience with that without re-traumatizing her as much as possible. And, and so we just picked out the kind of like biggest examples of it. Sorry, it's trash day. Um, I don't know. If you can hear that. Uh, yeah. And I'm curious just how difficult it was to sort of track down subjects for this. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it's difficult, of course, to get people on the record talking about the Spears saga. We've done reporting, some reporting on it at the Daily Beast and know how difficult it is. Um, so, I mean, how difficult was that? And also, what were your dealings with the Spears family like trying to get them on the record for this piece? Yeah, I think that um, we sort of went into this in a way that was, um, I, I don't know if it was naive, but it was, we went into it thinking that it might be easier to get people to talk about Britney and to, um, you know, because she's one of the biggest pop icons of our time. Um, why wouldn't you want to talk about Britney? Um, but I think that uh, what we realized going into it was just, it was a whole different ball game. And we sort of wanted to work our way inward um, as far as casting goes. And casting was really fun and really interesting. We have this like casting doc that has hundreds of names and broken down by different topics. And these are like nerdy journalists things that like, I don't know if other people, you know what I mean? Anyone who's not a journalist watching is probably like, I don't care about this, but other journalists might be like, a hundred names, hundreds of names on a casting was, was, was on Excel over sheet. a thousand. Oh, it was, was over counted. a thousand. Yeah. Yeah. So that, <laughs> um, that casting doc was uh, a work of art on its own. And I think that we realized um, sort of going into it, how it was the opposite of what we thought and how unwilling people were to actually talk about Brittany and her current situation and how um, so the information around her and just her inner circle was so sort of confined that the people who had information that would be valuable to us was restrictive restricted and um so it was it was it was baby steps to sort of get there in the beginning and you know it wasn't a simple like call to felicia and then you know it was it was done it was sort of being able to build these bridges between sources and be able to um work our way to um sort of gain the trust and then make it to someone who was as close to Brittany as uh, Felicia. I mean, this story is so difficult to report because it involves uh, a lot of sealed court records. Almost everything is sealed or redacted. A lot of medical records and private records about minor children that we can't access and that we wouldn't necessarily even want to if we if we could since they're private health records. Um, and there's also NDAs, celebrity NDAs. It's also an ongoing legal battle. <clears throat> so, you know, I think it's kind of standard in a legal battle for lawyers to advise their clients not to speak to the media because what they say could be used as evidence later. And so it was so it was really hard because one thing I felt in, incredibly ethically conflicted about it. I've never made a piece without the participation of a main of the main the central person in it. And so I guess the way I justified it to myself was to try to never, um, never guess what was inside Britney's head. And so everybody we talked to, I didn't want to have, I didn't want to interview people who would automatically go and start telling you what Britney was thinking or feeling because nobody knows what she was thinking or feeling. So we wanted to only include firsthand uh, people who had firsthand experience that they were describing from their own perspective or people who were com commenting on our culture or could speak to the, the culture around her. And even in our reporting and the bites we chose, the editing, it was like, never say what's inside Britney's head, never say what's inside Britney's head. So I think that was also a challenge um, as well. A lot of people spoke to us on background. A lot of people spoke to us on background, but they would not go on camera. So it informed the piece we made, but it appears like there's not very many people who actually know what's going on in it, maybe. 
Um, yeah. Was and it, I would also just add, sorry, I would also just add because we get this a bunch is that uh, at the end of the doc, you see that we list all the people that we weren't able to or who wouldn't talk to us essentially. Um, that list is not inclusive of all of the people that we spoke to or all the people that we reached out to. It's just the ones that we sort of uh, pinpointed. Just for I'm curious what it was like to try to reach Brittany um, and get her involved in the documentary. I mean, who did you have to go through? Were there like a lot of conduits? Um, and also, if you were aware that there is allegedly a competing series at Netflix that they're making on Britney Spears that she's participating in. Uh, yeah, we knew about the Netflix doc before, um, before we started. It's directed by Aaron Carr, who is, um, you know, a colleague in the, this world. And so we, we were able to talk about it before. And, um, you know, I think that the more about Brittany is exposed, the better. Um, and, and, you know, I also feel totally like so many people have made fun of, I mean, so many people have made money off of Brittany's image without her consent that I am not going to get competitive with anybody for the privilege of doing that. Um, and so we really, we had, we talked together uh, to each other like a few times throughout this and stuff. And so I'm excited for her too. Yeah. And as um, far as like the channels, sorry. Um, as far as like the channels of like getting in touch with Brittany, right. We've, we've gone through the official channels. Uh, we've gone through, you know, her manager, um, I believe her publicist. Uh, we've gone through sort of the official channels. We've tried to talk to her mom. We've tried to talk to her um, father. Um, and then we've also tried to reach out to family members and close friends. And um, so we've, we've tried everything besides, uh, you know, going up to her door. <laughs> and, and people have told us that they uh, sent her the request. So, but it's just so unclear if she has a phone that's receiving those are not and if um yeah if if she they got to her which is so uh scary yeah i mean you know you know this is a, a journalism school and one of the things that the documentary focuses on is media complicity um in the the saga of britney spears and and i'm curious if you could discuss that because it does seem like it's something that a lot of people are focusing on the way that People, those in the media, there's the Diane Sawyer interview. There's, you know, people have been pulling up old David Letterman interviews of Lindsay Lohan. Um, but, but generally, um, the way that the media at large treated celebrities who are maybe going through it a little bit on the mental health side. You know, I mean, it, it seems like it was very um, inelegant, to say the least, the way that they treated people and, and really quite vulture-ish. Um, but I, I wonder if you could talk about that. I honestly, I had no idea people were going to understand what we were trying to say by showing those uh, clips. Honestly, so many people make fun of Britney Spears. It's just a normal thing. Everybody makes fun of Britney Spears. When, when I would tell people that I was doing this project, you would get this smirk like, oh, Britney Spears project, huh? And I really honestly think that it was totally okay to make fun of Britney Spears until two weeks ago. Um, and when, and I had no idea this was going to hit such a nerve to change things. I actually, my biggest fear was that people were gonna look at the footage and make fun of her again, and like see the same thing they saw in 2007 when they looked at the footage. So it, it was really shocking to me that, um, that, it's, that people got what we were trying to say and something so moving like career high point in my life is that we are sorry Brittany started trending online and people started like regular people i'm not talking about justin timber like regular people started um saying like i'm sorry for laughing at the jokes about you i'm sorry for buying the, the magazine about you and that was just um more than i ever thought would happen yeah i think that that is one of the the biggest sort of um i, I don't know victories of our of our film is just seeing people react the way that they have. And actually, I think when we put this out there, I think our expectations were sort of low in the sense because we we anticipated that we would be putting that out there and that you would be able to see the media coverage and the inappropriate questions and things like that. But I don't think that, like we weren't clear if people were going to respond the way that we did. 
right? When I think when like Sam talks about how we just went through so much footage um, and we're talking about paparazzi, we're talking about interviews, we're talking about, you know, family feud clip, all of these things. Um, we felt something and, you know, there was a mix of emotions. There was disgust. There was just pure sadness for um, this kid growing up having to, you know, being asked inappropriate questions that, you know, through the lens of today just feels wrong. But I don't think that we anticipated that putting that all together and putting that out there, that people would feel the same. I think that was uh, one of my biggest fears is that people weren't going to react to the footage and the archival that we that we put together and all the interviews and stuff that they weren't going to react in that same way. Also, shout out to Johanna Schiller, our archival producer who yes. I saw on this call. She is She's a amazing, a goddess. Um, all of those. I have things. no idea what she and did more. <laughs> So I'm, cu I'm curious too, you know, a lot of people have focused on the villainy, quote unquote, of Justin Timberlake and all this. Um, and I'm curious how you guys feel about that, um, the focus on it, and also his apology, which seemed, uh, you know, maybe 19, 20 years too late. But I'm, I'm curious what you guys think of that. You know, um, in the film, we feature this music video, this Crimea music, Crimea River. Crimea River. Video. That was the most um, that, you know, it was a super popular song. It like launched Justin's career it was a uh, he won a Grammy that year. And uh, I asked everybody in our interview, what do you remember about that music video? Like, can you describe the plot of that music video to me? And almost everybody said, isn't that the one where the Britney lookalike cheats on Justin? Um, but what actually happens in that music video is that a Britney lookalike is a walking down the street and Justin secretly starts following her, follows her into her home, hides in her closet, watches her take off her clothes, watches her get in the shower, scares her up against the glass, runs away and leaves a sex tape of himself and another woman in her home. That is what happened and nobody remembers that. It's like revisionist history of what happened and that was such a successful album. And so I think Justin apologizing or, or apologizing-ish as Christiane Amanpourmai, graduation speaker from day school said um <laughs> but uh it's it's symbolic but it really what i want to know is how who came up with that idea and how many people did it have to go through to approve it to get it on the air and how many people had to make up that narrative had to you know put across that narrative that britney's a cheater and justin's heartbroken in the magazines and i think that it's uh not just him it's it's the whole machine so hopefully people are looking inward about that also yeah yeah i also think that just like quoting wesley from the film right we have an infrastructure to support misogyny and that was true then and it's still true now and um although we can sort of look back and and see the parts of uh you know britney's life and things that were um wrong or that we might feel ashamed about i think that we still you know a, a point in our film is not just to say like <laughs> look at us you know look at how much progress we've made that would never happen today you know it's not completely true you know there's still work to be done and there's still things moving forward that we need to sort of keep in our minds you know britney needs to be a bit more of um a lesson moving forward and not something that is just like oh one thing that was like oh my bad in the past it's it's sort of it needs to you need to have that reminder with you and just the nature of conservatorships you know there there seems to be something so almost like yellow wallpapery sanitarium me about it i mean to control someone's finances and strip them of their you know personal liberties um and you know it does seem to be quite gendered right because like a lot of the conservatorships celebrity conservatorships i've read about like there was a potential one put on Courtney Love. Um, there's, you know, the one that Britney Spears has been under. So I, I wonder if you could talk about just the nature of conservatorships, which seems to just violate a number of personal rights. It's, it's almost like if Britney Spears, whatever she's going through, she should at least be able to control her financial 
destiny, I guess, you know, for better or worse. Like MC Hammer was able to blow $300 million and nobody said anything <laughs> about it. So, yeah, um, I think I, uh, something that is sad to me that I heard over and over again is that uh, Britney Spears probably would not be in this situation, almost assuredly would not be in this situation if she didn't have a lot of money. So it's not like she was so out of control that this would have happened to her no matter how much money she had. Um, and, you know, a conservatorship is this unique legal arrangement where um, somebody is deemed incapable of making decisions in their own best interest, and then the court uh, assigns somebody else to make those legal decisions for them. And they're very basic decisions. I asked somebody, what's the way that, like, what's best case scenario for a conservatorship? Why do they exist? And um, it's, so say your mother has Alzheimer's and the neighbor from down the street has been coming over trying to get her to sign over her estate, change her will to the neighbor. You as the daughter could, um, you know, apply for this conservatorship. This, it's a legal protection so that, and then you are assigned to making decisions that your mother would make about her finances and her healthcare if she was in her right mind. So it's very suspicious and different for a 26 year old to be in this. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, she's the only person who has made millions of dollars in Las Vegas while being under a conservatorship um, with her own face and body. And um, some of the things we learned from court documents that they had the power to do is they have the power to make healthcare decisions for her. They have the power to choose her doctors. Um, they have the power to access all of her medical records. And um, we've heard possibly decide what of her medical records to share with her, um, allegedly. And we also, they uh, are in charge of all her finances. For her, that means they can enter into business deals for her. They can sign checks for her. She can't do those things herself. Um, they also control her investments and all of her money. So um, Brittany, we saw these court documents that were unsealed accidentally, um, and then they were sealed again, but they, they have to list out every single penny Brittany spends down to what she spends at Starbucks. You know, we saw a lot of like $30 and 35 cents at Target, $17 at Walmart, um, you Going know, $21 at the forest like $3 and 75 cents at the gas station. And that um, to me is uh, so condescending when somebody is making millions of dollars. Um, she at one point was making a million dollars a week while under this in Las Vegas. So there's a lot of suspicious things to dig into as journalists and there's way more to dig into. So we are hoping to continue investigating this. Yeah, and also, I mean, I think, uh, you know, just like a reminder is that a conservatorship is um, is for the elderly. Like the system was was built um, with the elderly and and people with cases like dementia and, and and such in mind. It wasn't built or created for a 26 year old pop star that's bringing in millions of dollars. So I think when you see a part in the film where um, her co-conservator at the time, Andrew Wallet, refers to, um, you know, the conservatorship as a hybrid business, business model, um, you start to question, like, wait, what is this? And it's because the, syst the, the sort of structure that was built uh, around a conservatorship wasn't really made for people like Britney Spears. Um, and people, so... People who aren't dying, there's not a right. clear path to get out of it because it's most people die in them, but this has been taken up as a disability rights issue. Um, Human Rights Watch recently wrote about it. The ACLU has been writing about it because uh, people sometimes people with developmental disabilities uh, are put under these things, and they're so 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 restrictive that it uh, that it's a rights issue that they're bringing up in this, and it's not. Um, no one's keeping track of it. If anyone wants yeah. to do data journalism, like no one's keeping track of how many people are in these and who they are. So we don't know how many people with developmental disabilities could be put in these like highly restrictive um, circumstances that where it could be open for abuse and where uh, they could not make, not be allowed to make basic decisions that they're capable of making. Yeah, and also the data is a bit spread out because it's different, um, it's different per state. Um, and in like California, it's called a conservatorship, but in other places it's called a, guard, a legal guardianship. Um, so it, it sort of varies uh, state to state as well. And yeah, I mean, the documentaries certainly seem to have an impact. I mean, we, we had the recent judges ruling where now Brittany's conservatorship will be, uh, Jamie's will be shared with a financial firm. Um, so, I mean, 
Those um, headlines are super misleading, actually, yeah. um, as in many, many things about Britney Spears coverage. Um, so the what happened was very procedural and very um, not like nothing really happened at the last court case. It's exactly what we thought in November. She agreed to allow Jamie and Bessemer Trust, this fiduciary that does this professionally, to be co-conservators. She ruled that. What Brittany's court-appointed attorney, Sam Ingham, I say court-appointed attorney because her she was deemed incapable of choosing her own attorney back in 2008 and has still not been able to choose her own attorney. So she had one assigned to her by the court, who's not a public defender. Uh, he is a person who gets paid the same amount of money as a millionaire would pay a lawyer. Uh, when when the millionaire got to choose the lawyer, uh, but he asked for Jamie to be temporarily suspended, her father to be temporarily suspended. The judge did not agree to that, but she did assign Bessemer as co-conservator. Three months later, the Jamie's lawyers file to uh, give him these kind of outlandish rights that would make it so that he still gets to be in charge, which we knew she was going to strike down. So then she struck it down, but then they still haven't decided anything. So it also is a window into our, our legal system, how everything takes so long, like the path to get Brittany out of this conservatorship, if like it just goes how it's been going would be years. And as that's happening, all lawyers on all sides, including her father's lawyers and all conservators are getting paid out of Brittany's estate. So that is another quirk of the system that Brittany is paying lawyers to fight against each other about what's in her best interest. Yeah. Yeah. And it, just to, if there's any uh, sort of like just to clarify a bit. So um, Bessemer Trust uh, was put on to be a co-conservator with Jamie Spears. Um, and that was already ruled. And basically in this latest court uh, hearing, which I think I feel like every time there's a there's a new court hearing, I think um, me specifically, I'm just like something big is going to happen. And then we attend it or, you know, uh, find out what happened and it's sort of like not much has happened um so this was the case and the judge sort of just um was like jamie bessemer you guys talk it out figure out what your duties are going to be you know sharing this uh co-conservatorship uh, or being in this co-conservatorship relationship um of britney's estate and um sort of figure it out write it up and then bring it back to me is basically what um happened in the last hearing I know there's been a lot of focus on Jamie, um, but what about um, Brittany's mother and sister? Because, you know, I mean, I, mean, I, I guess, you know, we know that Jamie Lynn was placed as a trustee um, at a certain point of the Britney Spears conservatorship, but then she wasn't, she was dropped. Um, and I, I've always been curious why, um, how Jamie kind of, I guess, weaseled his way into the conservatorship role in the first place and why Brittany's mother wasn't, say, placed as the conservator. I mean, she she seemed more, way more involved in Britney's career than Jamie. Yeah, I think the, um, I, I'll let Sam also answer this, but I think that um, the short answer is we sort of don't know, right? There's a lot that we don't know. Um, and I think going into this story, we, we knew that a lot would be sealed. So as far as um, how Jamie became the, the, the conservator of her person and of her estate, we don't know. Um, and as far as we know, um, Lynn hasn't actually, uh, she hasn't been considered to be a conservator of the state. Um, Lynn uh, did request to sort of have her lawyer attend the conservatorship hearings and to be able to, uh, you know, be kept in the know of the situation. But um, as far as we know, Lynn hasn't tried to be, become conservator over Brittany. And yeah. yeah. And some, yeah, something that we couldn't get into in the film, but we're very interested in looking into further. If anyone has firsthand knowledge of this, this is my journalist pitch. You can send me a tip. My email's on my Twitter. Um, firsthand knowledge, please. Um, the, you know, Jamie Spears didn't set up the conservatorship by himself. There was a business manager named Lou Taylor that a lot of people are interested in looking into. There was also other people, you know, these lawyers do this for a living. There's a possibility that there are conflicts of interest in this small circle of lawyers who do conservatorships that we, you know, we've seen examples of that happen with other people. Um, and the circumstances under which she was put under this, it's questionable. 
uh, what exactly happened, why she was held at, in a 5150 mental health hold while this was going on. There was a five day, you're supposed to have five days of notification before you're put into a conservatorship and the judge waived this for Jamie. So uh, Brittany was still in the hospital when this was decided. Um, something that I found out recently was that her, the person who became her court appointed attorney, Sam Ingham, um, actually was someone who went to visit her in the hospital to write a report along with a doctor hired by Jamie's team um, to say that she was incapable of hiring her own lawyer. And then he was assigned to be her lawyer and has made um, at some points $10,000 a week being her lawyer. Um, and he's been her lawyer for 13 years. So there's a lot of um, areas to look into sealed records to figure out what's in. Um, but yeah, we don't know. So I'm not suggesting all this stuff is true, but I'm suggesting that it is ready and apparent to look into. Right. It sort of feels like our film was like the, the, the starting point. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we're supposed to open up to audience questions, right? Um, yeah, there's a few questions in there. Um, one of, I'll, I'll post two so you can answer them in order. Um, there's a question, will there be more coverage about what role the courts play? how judges have justified the ongoing detainment of her individual rights. And then the second question is, uh, following up on media culpability, um, this is a New York Times production and whether you look into the New York Times' responsibility in terms of going after Brittany during her career. Yes. So what was the first question? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, the role the courts play and, and yeah. how judges have justified the ongoing detainment of her rights. Oh, absolutely. I think we need to look into that. You know, it's um, a lot of judges, I, I think from, you know, what I know are just are trying to uh, make decisions based down to the very letter of exactly what the law says. And so, you know, we're looking a lot at probate court reform because if they're making decisions based on a law that appears to have uh, be open for conflicts of interest and um, doesn't have clear uh, rules or boundaries, um, then I think it's looking into the probate court. Um, but there's also, you know, I, we can look into everybody. There's a possibility, you know, judges are, there's different, judges do different things. Um, and yes, and the New York Times stuff. So we did, you know, there has been some uh, bad coverage by the New York Times. Um, what we did in the film was try to take the biggest uh, examples, the one, the tabloids are what we looked at. So the ones with the big headlines and the big pictures that people around the world saw, that one still frame of her shaving her head. Um, we wanted to see what was outside of that frame. That's part of the reason it's called Framing Britney Spears. What was the backstory behind it? What led up to it? Why do people consider her crazy by looking at it? And how much is it still affecting her now? Um, but yeah, we, somebody at the Times wrote about the Times's culpability. I think it, they didn't have the extreme headlines like the tabloids, but there's definitely this um, smirky coverage, better than thou coverage. Uh, something that I was that really shocked me was I doing this. I did a lot of interviews with entertainment uh, coverage, like Entertainment Tonight, Extra, blah blah blah, all the inter sorry. All the entertainment things that um, I had seen bad coverage of Britney in before. And I was so like, whoa, why am I doing this? They're going to be so disrespectful. I know this. But then when I actually did the interview, it was a woman my age who wanted to talk about it super seriously and had a whole different perspective growing up with Britney like we did. I'm a, about the same age as Britney. Um, so I do think also the gatekeepers in those different places, including the New York Times, have changed. Um, so we're covering it differently. But um, yeah, I, maybe we should have done it since we are New York Times. There's a lot more women and people of color at these institutions, which always improves coverage, I think. Um, you know, yeah. so I, I see an interesting question here. Um, can you speak to criticism about giving too much credence to free Britney supporters and including the unverified voicemail in the piece? Um, yeah, so the, the including the unverified voicemail in the piece, it felt like um, it was such a major component in what sort of 
sparked the resurgence of the Free Britney movement that it felt like we would be trying to, you know, explain how the world came about without the Big Bang, right? Like the voicemail was the Big Bang. And um, so even though it is in the piece and it is unverified, uh, we had to include it because it wasn't necessarily if, uh, you know, we weren't focusing on exactly what was said in the voicemail, rather the impact that it had and how from that episode, it sort of branched out and emboldened the Free Britney movement. Yeah, and I, I think including that was probably the most controversial thing with at the times, um, or the thing we yeah. talked about the most. And so we have a disclaimer that we couldn't verify the source. Um, we think maybe we know who the source is, but we didn't want to um, violate the, you know, the podcaster's connection um, with them or promises to them. Um, we think we know from independent reporting, but the, uh, and then, you know, afterwards, we have this quote from that uh, her manager, Larry Rudolph, saying that it's that it's not real and she elected to go into the facility herself um, from the Washington Post. And the reason we have had to dig up a Washington Post quote was that no one would talk to us to rebut it. We asked everybody, Liz Day, who you see in the piece, is like a super legal uh, beast person everyone's a beast um but the uh she wrote out every single allegation you know made against jamie spears every single allegation made against all the everybody and sent it to their lawyers months in advance and had back and forth about like are they can we respond to this if okay if you're not going to go on camera can you send a representative okay if you're not going to send a representative can you just write the response and we yeah. just got nothing. So we couldn't find anyone to do, to discredit it. And so we had to dig up a Washington Post article from back then to at least put on screen to, you know, but yeah. Yeah, two of the more, um, I guess I wanted to ask you guys, uh, two of the more odious characters in the Britney Spears saga are Sam Lufty and uh, Adnan Ghalib. Um, and they were the two who were kind of who latched onto her right before the conservatorship. Um, like right before the conservatorship, this, I don't think this is in the documentary so much, but Adnan had been like shopping a sex tape of Britney Spears and himself, an alleged sex tape. Um, but like basically it was her involvement with these two people that almost, it seems like led to a lot of this activity with the conservatorship. And I'm curious what it was like to try to get a hold of them. Um, and, uh, and also maybe, uh, exploring those two characters in in the saga in the piece itself yeah um we spoke to sam Lutfi's lawyer um and uh reached out to adnan uh and tried to talk to him um but i will say from a lot of different um sources that we spoke to it wasn't like I, I I don't want to just isolate it as just them. There were a number of unsavory, unsavory supposed uh, characters in Britney's life before uh, some of her major struggles. So I will, I will add that. Yeah, an issue we also had was there were certain people no one would talk about on camera. Yeah. Um, so if you notice in the piece when we bring up Sam Lep Sam Lepfi, um Liz has to explain it uh, because no one would talk about him. Um, no one would talk about, like, for example, Lou Taylor or some of these other managers um, that were around. So um, that was a reporting challenge also. There's like certain people no one wants to say anything about. Yeah. Another fan question that I thought was fun is, how do you decide on the backdrop for the interviews? I I've, <laughs> I've, I've been curious about this myself. Well. A wonderful um, backdrop. Uh, which which Mel like made beyond the my wildest dreams. Uh, so the you know we it, we filmed this entire thing during COVID. The entire thing we worked on this for like six and a half months, I think total. So the yeah. whole thing was during the pandemic, and we had to follow very strict rules in filming. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that this archival like mostly archival project got greenlit because we were looking for archival based projects to do during the pandemic um and the 
we had to film outside. All the interviews had to be filmed outside to follow the rules. And I didn't want it to be an unmotivated decision, just have like people randomly outside. I wanted there to be it to be purposeful. And so I had been looking through Brittany's Instagram obsessively. Um, so obsessively. And, and the, uh, you know, so much of it takes place in this super lush California backyard, greenery, flowers, roses are this reoccurring theme. She loves roses. She posts them all over the place. Um, there's wilted roses, there's crying roses, there's happy roses. And uh, I just wanted to create something that felt like it existed in that world, that it was her world. And so we decided to make um, the Free Britney fans be the ones that had full rose backdrops so that it could differentiate them from everybody else who had mostly green with different color flowers that represented their energy, I think, um, which Brittany's also into. Um, and the, you know, after we had already started filming in front of the rose backdrop, then Brittany started posting about the rose project on Instagram. Um, so it was not that we were copying the rose project. It was that we were trying to exist in her world and like really got yeah. her world. Um, and, you know, I asked, since we were trying to get in touch with Brittany, I asked everybody, I thought she would like the rose wall. So I took pictures of it and asked everybody like, send this to somebody who could send it to Brittany. Like, do you know anyone? So I don't know if she ever got sent it, but, uh, I thought she would like it. And so it was very shocking when the rose project came out. Yeah. And, was and there was also, trouble. <laughs> it was very, um, what we loved about it is, it, is it's very fantasy esque and there's a lot of sort of, you know, uh, and I think that when you visit Brittany's Instagram, you know, you could spend like we did months on end, <laughs> just sort of like going through and just trying to decipher it. And, um, the rose background was such a beautiful thing. And like, what I like to say is that, um, Sam's idea of a rose background, she was so also another side thing, Sam was having dreams with Brittany for like day, like night after oh, night damn. after night. She was just in, in Sam's head. And so I like to think that just like through dream world, they were on the same wavelength. <laughs> and so we had this beautiful rose wall built that had to be able to be broken down. <laughs> we had to figure it out. It was insane to create. Um, but then when Brittany launched the, you know, the Just a Touch of Rose project, it was just like, I like to think that just her and Sam were on the same wavelength. And that's how we were able to <laughs> make something that was so aligned with uh, Brittany. Yeah, I guess just lastly, um, you know, have, did Brittany know the stock was coming? And since it's come out, have you um, gotten any word from Brittany or from her camp about the feedback? Um, what, do, what do they think of it? What do, maybe what does Brittany think of it if, if that message has been communicated to, to you guys? You know, there's such a tight circle around Brittany enabled by the conservatorship that it is that is legally allowed to restrict who, who interacts with her, that it's really hard to say. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to know. Um, you know, we sent, if she got our request, she knew about it, right? And, mm -hmm. and we know, you know, Felicia is still in touch with her. There are people who are still in her world that knew about it and talked about it to people who know her, said maybe they talked about it to her, but it's unclear um, if that happened. And uh, we don't know from, from Brittany's conservatorship team and her, uh, you know, manager, publicist uh, crew, we don't, they have not reached out to us. Um, no, at all. we know her mother watched it. That's but. good. <laughs> no, thank, thank you, Samantha and Melanie, so much for participating today. Um, it, it was really informative and it was nice speaking with you. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, congratulations, Samantha and Melanie, on this great documentary. And um, also congratulations on achieving your life goal of appearing in the AP Day Planner. <laughs> yes. yes, forgot to mention that. That was so incredible. It said that the film was premiering in the AP Day Planner. <laughs> yeah, Only we really celebrated that. People will get that. <laughs> Tim Harper, you get that. Tim Harper yes. sent me on all my AP Day Planner assignments. Thank you all and thank you everyone for joining us. And uh, we look forward to the next program at the school. Amazing.
Thank Bye -bye. you all. Thank you. Bye.